Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another special edition of the show. We're doing more of the Texas Winery Wine Tour. Um, and I'm, I'm here at Perdinalis Cellars, not Pedronalis, <laughs> um, which I'll let, I'll let them explain that a little bit. Um, but Perdinalis, and um, I, I'm joined by um, three awesome people here. Uh, Frederick, Julie. I, Julie, and David. <laughs> Sorry. I, I don't know why we've been talking for about an hour it feels like and I've already started forgetting names. Um, anyway, so uh, we've got some great people here. They're going to talk about the winery. We're going to drink some great wines. I've been wanting to come here for a while. Uh, I've, I've, met, I've met them. I've met Frederick and Julie in the past at Texom. I've met some other people from uh, Pernalis at uh, Culinaria or Culinaria, however you want to pronounce it, down in San Antonio. Um, so this is one of the stops I've been wanting to do for quite a while. Um, so let's get some introductions going along. Uh, we'll start to my right, David. Yeah. Why don't you uh, kind of, and we'll just kind of go around. Uh, tell us who you are and sure. what you do and all that, okay? Sure. Well, I'm David Culkin. Uh, I'm the winemaker here. I, uh, myself, Julie, and Friedrich, we founded this winery back in uh, 2005. Uh, my background is is that I kind of got introduced to this business when our parents came out, when Julie and I's parents came out and planted the vineyard in the early 90s. Uh, learned a little bit in the process there, but we really came along later when we decided to join and start this. Um, I went and got my education at UC Davis for viticulture and enology, um, and we've been making wine subsequently since 2006, as well as, of course, expanding the vineyard at uh, at our at our state spot just north of Fredericksburg. So um, now we're in, obviously coming into our 2012, so we're what, about seven years into making wine here, or yeah, that's about right. So, uh, but yeah, that's that's my job, mm -hmm. Julie. Well, I'm Julie Colk and I have the same background, family background as Dave, obviously. Uh, my, uh, my input has been focused more on the branding and marketing. Uh, I designed the labels uh, and have you know worked on making Pedernal Cellars you have a unique look uh, that makes it stand out and really match its style. Um, can't think of anything else to add to the family <laughs> stories if that's been covered, so I will pass it on to Frederick. <laughs> right, so I'm, I'm Frederick Osterberg, and um, so uh, um, I, I, uh, I'm currently the president of the winery, and uh, what I always say is that uh, David and Judy, they have the fun jobs, and then I, I take care of the rest, and so that's, uh, that's pretty much it. So. So um, first off, so if you're not from the Texas area or really from this part of Texas, um, it is Perdinalis. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. I don't know if you know why it's pronounced that way. It's just mm -hmm. one of those things that, and, and lo localities love to love to, I guess, have these weird pronunciations. I've lived in quite a few other places in the country, and and there seems to be some weird pronunciations for everything all around the country, and I'm sure around the world too, but. Um, in, in their local languages, but it's one of those weird things. So um, uh, it's it's like I said, it's, it's great to be here uh, and do that. Um, so we, you started in 2005, and um, uh, prior to that, you had the vineyards mm -hmm. uh, north of north of Fredericksburg, and that's been in the family for a while, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now they uh, well, my my parents took uh, my father really, but anyway, took early retirement. Uh, and so he had a chance to really start over. And I was actually living in California at the time that they were planning this. And he came out to do you know, various seminars in California to see, you know, to learn about planting a vineyard. They spent a lot of time looking at the soil types to make sure they had a good site for a vineyard and the way the, you know, the sunlight would hit it in the morning and all the, the details you want. Uh, and then they also had a consultant come out, people they've known that, that have been in the business their whole lives. Uh, and so they, they took it very seriously as a second career. Uh, and they did for 10 years. They ran it really entirely themselves. I mean, we came out and we helped plant, do the first planting yeah. uh, and, you know, help water before the drip Drag lines came. Hoses. Drag hoses. Yeah, it was literally by hand. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, but yeah, I mean, they, you know, from a year to year 
point of view they were running it themselves yeah. so and it, it helped because we also saw what varietals worked and didn't work mm -hmm. it was almost right. like a test vineyard that initial uh, five acres uh, so that was very useful that sort of hit you know, built up knowledge and it's very hands-on we were talking about that earlier um, with with a lot of the Texas wineries there's a lot of hands-on um, there isn't a lot of like outside you know, like ownership and you know the ownership is involved you know 100 percent in in with the wineries versus maybe other places in the world that that um, it's become more of a business mm -hmm. you know and, and uh, you know, that's one of the great things about coming out to these wineries here in Texas is that I've, I'm actually meeting I'm, I'm, I'm meeting the people who are 100% involved in this and there's not some some place out in some other city that just happens to own it like some insurance company like no I know in France they seem to be insurance companies you seem to be buying a lot of wineries or chateaus out there or ending uh, up with them yeah <laughs> or ending up with them right <laughs> that too or or other or other investors but um yeah. You know, it's it's one of the things that that being out here um, this week and also other weeks, other other times have been out into the Texas wineries is there's uh, a great hospitality that happens. Um, and not that I didn't, I got a lot of hospitality when I went to Bordeaux, but it's a different hospitality, you know. Sure. Um, so that's really great. Um, so you you grow quite a few. Uh, you grow about we we're talking about about six or seven varieties. Yeah, primarily. I mean, really, at the top of the list is the Tempranillo, right? Um, and then Viognier is second behind that, and then after that, Mavedra, Grenache, Syrah, and Tariga really make up most of the rest. We have, you know, from the original plantings, my parents, and this is, you know, Julie kind of got to this, is that you know it's been an experiment. They planted originally Merlot, mm -hmm. Cab, uh, they had some Sangiovese, as well as actually some Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc, and you know, learned along the way which of those you know did or did not work. We. You notice we Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc not in that that the conversation anymore at all. And the other varietals we've used to certain degrees, but along the along the process started doing experimental plots and discovered some of those others that worked much better for us and produced much better wines. And so that's kind of dictated the path going forward. So we, we have some of those. We still use the Merlot a little bit, and you'll see that in the tasting room actually. Okay. But uh, that's you know we, we've we've used this time over the last 15, 16 years as a learning process about which varietals would actually be the ones we use in the long term. So. What what brought you into interest in into wine making? Because you had a different little bit of different background. Yeah, it had nothing to really do with wine other than the vineyard, right? Um, well, I don't know. You know, I had a history degree, an engineering degree, and a business degree. So this is as close as I could come to actually combining those into something that would be uh, practical. So yeah, no, I mean, I, it it's fun. I, I think the thing is, is that we all loved this idea because we we wanted to run a business. We wanted to be able to create something. Um, and of course, the fact that our parents had gotten the business, we had that. That initial piece that's so critical. I mean, it's the grapes are the part that makes the wine, and then you know we then sort of naturally fell into roles in terms of actually making this work. I mean, Friedrich has great business experience and good in terms of just structuring and building a business. I had the experience on more kind of the, the practical engineering side of things, so that worked. And Julie has the really the art and creative skills and the marketing skills, and so can naturally fit in. We each have gravitated towards the roles that made sense. So cool, very nice. And we were talking earlier about the philosophies and and um, and your philosophy really is to let the let the land speak for itself instead of trying to manipulate it right sure yeah I, I, I think I think very much so the idea is to is to not to try to hide that we're here in Texas but to be proud of it and 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 to say yes we should let the terroir speak and let the grapes tell the story where they're from that's yeah. very important to us yeah I, I really I really like that because um, I like I like when when the wineries in Texas are, are really focusing on that, you know. And um, this is again one of the reasons why I want to come out here because I know we had either either we have talked about it or somewhere along the line I've I've known that that's pretty much what you what you do here. Um, and you know that's that's something that I think is really valuable with just no matter whether it's Texas or California or or in Europe, is that you know wine you really want the wine to speak of that area rather than just be a generic Cabernet Sauvignon that could be grown anywhere and you know in in my studies and what what I do as far as the sommelier side of things you know that's one of the things about your blind tastings is you are trying to figure out where it comes from and and sometimes we're wrong <laughs> and sometimes we're right and <laughs> and it's it's a very it's a learning process it's lots of fun but at the same time you know when I open a bottle of wine from a particular area, there is an expectation that there should be something to speak of that area rather right. than just it's Coca-Cola and it's the same no matter where you where you drink it, you know. Right. <laughs> right. So um, that's that's really nice to have that. Um, 
How many about, and now we talked about the varietals, about how many uh, bottlings do, or, or labels do you have? It's, it's, about, it's about a dozen different okay. wines that we do um, every year, and, and some of them go... Yeah, they go up and down. Yeah. Some disappear and then reappear, you know. Yeah, some of them um, are available uh, widely in, um, out in stores and such, and some are only available here at the estate. Okay, yeah. Yeah. and you also have a wine club, right? Sure. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you all, and some of those wines are only for the wine club, mm -hmm. correct? Like you, like yeah. you, you won't see them out in retail. Yeah. Um, have you had the wine club from the beginning, or was it something more recent? It, we started it very early, yeah. okay, and it's been it's been growing. Yeah, this is something I think that really you have to point to Frederick's innovation. He really pushed that very early. He he recognized that it was a very important part of the California, you know, wine business to have these wine clubs, and so in Texas that had not been a big thing. But Frederick very quickly, you know, put that together and. It's been, it, it's very nice, because it's really the chance to really talk to customers and to see them, you know, again and again, and, and you know, have a more nearly long-term relationship. Uh, so. yeah, we have wine club members that have essentially become friends. And right. We've gotten to know them, and it's, it's, a, it's a great experience. I mean, it, it's great, you have somebody come in the tasting room, they taste, they buy something, but, but wine club, it's a more longer-term conversation. It's yeah, it's a commitment, you yes. know. Yes. Um, are most of your members lo uh, Texas from Texas or do you have uh, do you have a good amount that are outside of Texas? I, I love telling people that we have one club members in Napa. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, we, we nice. Do, and uh, most are in Texas of course, but uh, they're they're on, you know, east coast, west coast and all over. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know we I meant to touch upon this before we sat down. Um, and I don't remember from the website, do you, if, if somebody wasn't part of the wine club but wanted to buy wine and lived outside of Texas or even inside of Texas, can they order directly from you and you can ship to them? And a handful of states. Handful yeah. of states, right. Yeah, and it's listed out there on the website with okay. the states we can do. So. Right, and that's, that's, a, that's a normal thing, you know. <laughs> Talk to your representatives in your yeah. respective in states. Pennsylvania and, and Utah. Yeah. <laughs> The so two states you can't ship to. Massachusetts, <laughs> another one. We need to get their act together. Yeah, yeah. no, it's every, every state's different. So every, yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's complicated. Free the grapes. Free the grapes. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I sometimes soapbox get on soapbox about <laughs> that wineries should be able to. Yeah, I should, as a consumer should be able to buy a wine from anybody. I should be able to buy it from you, from from. A, a retailer in New Jersey that I won't name that I used to buy from <laughs> but I can't buy from him anymore because it's not his fault because but our state won't allow it right. um, because to me it's like you know locally I won't be able to buy everything you know not sure. every retail can, can sell me everything so if there's a winery out out somewhere whether it's in the states or somewhere else I should be able to buy it so that's the end of my soapbox on that <laughs> um, I think I've already said it three times this week so I think I think the message has gotten across to the viewers because I, I think I think I seem to bring it up every time now um, but uh, uh, you know th that's I think that's an important piece though is being able to you're you're able to expand out and you're able to sell to outside of Texas because you're going to have people that want that want to buy your wine, mm -hmm. you know. And especially from what I've seen, you know, you have the big four and then you have the other 46. And to me, Texas really needs to be part of a big five because Texas really has been growing. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, it was mentioned in in la well okay, last week's show, which was yesterday, mm -hmm. um, about that you know Texas has become the hill country really has become a very big. Uh, or it has expanded a lot with tourism, and there's it's one of the most visited places in the country for wine, you know, mm -hmm. for wine. And, and I really think that, um, you know, it should be part of that. Um, all right, so we've got uh, we've got three wines we're going to be tasting here. So we're going to start off with uh, Viognier. So why Viognier? Why does it work so well here in Texas? Because mm -hmm. you know it, it's I, I see it a lot and I enjoy. It. I love Texas Viognier. Um, why Viognier? Well, I mean, without getting into a lot of the, like, the specific details, I mean, understand that the process of finding varietals like these has been an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we've, like I was just talking about, we've experimented in our vineyard. Viognier, in particular, a lot of the High Plains growers, like the Binghams and the Reddies, have experimented with this grape. And it's been a discovery process. You know, there's, you make certain, you know, assumptions about when you look at regions, you look at their wines, you look at their soils and climates. And, and ideally, we typically look to places like the Southern Rhone grapes, to Spain for varietals, but then it's the experimentation of, okay, let's put them in our vineyards, let's find out how they do and how we need to adapt them if we need to in terms of how we manage them to make them work. And, you know, Viognier, first of all, I, I really love the varietal. I love the, you know, the aromas you can get from a Viognier. So 
um, that's a good start. Obviously, you want to work with something that you'd like to make a wine with, but you, you, you find as you get things that are distinct to growing it in your own your own region. Um, and Viognier has been that. It's gone through this process over the last 10 to 15 years of small experiments turning into larger plantings and now actually being a really commercially planted grape. And we love it in the winery. It is absolutely a fantastic grape for us. Um, we're learning every year, but improving as we go and discovering how we can bring out the best out of the varietal. So. Nice. And I think, I think, I think Viognier is, is getting recognized as one of the top grapes for for Texas um, when we went to um, the San Francisco International Wine Competition and, and got a gold medal. It was the Viognier that got the gold mm -hmm. medal. It was, it was this Viognier here that, that won the Houston Rodeo uh, competition this year. And yeah. So it's, it's, it's up there. It's a grape and we can make world-class wine from Viognier in Texas. The other thing that's interesting about the Viognier is that you know, not all whites can, can take barrel aging. Viognier sure. can, so you can sure. get these variations. Uh, like mm -hmm. the reserve is, is very often had the, the barrel aging, so you get yeah. you know, different wines, both of which, uh, in fact, last year with the 2011, which unfortunately has ceased to be in existence, <laughs> uh, <laughs> is I mean to to taste the the reserve next to the non-reserve. I mean, mm -hmm. you had people who you know liked one or the other, uh, but they were just they were two really great wines, right? Both from the same grape. You yeah. can right. see the, the, you know, here's the winemaking coming into play and really saying, you know, there's lots of things we can do with this because it's such a good grape, so. And we were, this has a, been a really good year for you, right? With a lot of competitions and we're getting a lot of yes. recognition, right? Sure. Yes. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, very much so. Uh, gold in San Francisco, Gold Texom, Gold Lone Star. We won the Houston Rodeo. It's just, this is our big breakthrough year in, in that sense. So. Awesome. Yeah. Well, let's taste a little Viognier. Okay. Absolutely. All right. So this is the 2012 okay. Viognier, and so it's just been bottled, and it's a, it's a great vintage in uh, in my mind. Do you wanna do you wanna say something about this? Uh, well, I think you know yeah. again 2012, like he's saying, this this has been a good year. But we've and again, we've now been doing this varietal for for several years and learning each year. And so I mean, I feel like we improve each year, and we have mm -hmm. we have a lot still more to learn. But we again, it's 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 really been. It's been promising, so, mm -hmm. and obviously, again, the award is a is a you know great recognition for us, but uh, right, yeah, you know, yeah. well, it was also viticulturally a really good year. Yeah, it, and was, it was a, a really well good harvest. Year. It was a good harvest. We got, yeah. you know, at uh, you know Texas, we obviously you know we deal one of the things that's you know particular to this region is the variability that we'll see in terms of late freezes or you know sort of drought years or, or wetter years. This is a fairly balanced year, actually. A little bit warmer, but it's it's been ideal conditions for this varietal and for this grape. So, all right. So, the, yeah, that was something that we could talk about is um, how ha the the weather overall has been pretty good this year. I mean, you had a good balance of rain and and sure. mm -hmm. and non-rain. You know, I know in general for us in Texas, it's it's still I guess we're still kind of really in drought conditions. And you know, living in San Antonio, especially during the summer, you're hearing about water restrictions and level this and level that sure. and how, how bad it's going to be and, and, and all that, but um, it felt like this year wasn't as bad as the past couple years with, with the lack of rain. Sure. 2011 was desperate. Historic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely historic. And I mean, in the High Plains, uh, definitely extreme. And so, no, I mean, you know, and that's the thing is, one of the things that goes into picking grapes is Texas grapes have to be tough varietals. They have to be ones that can deal with that variability and that we can, you know, we can continue each year to be able to produce high quality crops from. And that's one of the things that some grapes may produce wonderful crops some years. And, you know, some, some of the, the growers here will, will work to try to get those to, to, you know, to be consistent. But it's, there's only certain varietals that ultimately can do that given the variability. And that's, again, Tempranillo and Viognier are particularly on the top of our sort of program because of that, so, you know. Very cool. Well, I'm already smelling it. <laughs> we were talking about the aromatics on Viognier, and that's, and I, it, is a, it is a particular favorite of mine, too. Um, so we can share. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, lots of floral notes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Somebody said Viognier is almost like perfume. It's just so much, <laughs> so much going on. Very aromatic, mm -hmm. very, uh, you can actually yeah. drink it. Perfume you can drink. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Perfume you can drink. Well, we're going to add that to the to the nice. study group nice. lists <laughs> of markers. <laughs> one one of the one of the well, I just have joined 
first of all, I was part of this group and I didn't really know it because it was really me and like two other people and really me and one other person most of the time. But during the summer, they everyone kind of t taken off, uh, taking the summer off. And so then I started going to this group again on Monday mornings. And then I realized that it was been the same group the whole time. But um, well, like the second or third time we were there, we were talking about uh, Albarino, and let me see if I can get this right. It it uh, has a Sauvignon Blanc nose, but a Riesling palate. Um, Interesting. So and then so that's one of those things where you know we have all these little markers, and it's supposed to help us with our blind tasting. But mm -hmm. you know, right. perfume you can drink. So yes. <laughs> when we do a Viognier next, I will mention that it's yeah. perfume you can drink. Right. Yeah. No, it's a fascinating varietal too because a different uh, you know depending on when we harvest it, you can get an interesting range. You can get at the low end sort of almost just a simple sort of citrus or maybe mm -hmm. some grapefruit. But as you move up and you harvest a little bit later along the line, you start to get these, you know, these peaches and honeysuckles and these, you know, sort of deeper, richer tropical fruits as well. And, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's really a spectrum. And, yeah, and I mean, it, yeah. And it yeah, needs... Yeah, it even has the, the first one. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it needs the heat. I mean, it, and it needs the conditions to really bring that out. And again, it's one of the reasons that it's a nice fit for us here in the state is, is that we have the kind of weather and the kind of conditions that really can bring out the best part of the NEA. When, so. uh, when did you harvest this year? Uh, well, in the, as far as the harvest date relative to previous years in the High Plains, it was still a little bit early for this varietal. Mm -hmm. um, and that's again a, f a function of, among other things, the fact that it was still a, a warmer than average year, even with the, the rain. So, um, but we were harvesting this up there like the second week of August. Okay. So, uh, and you know, typically most of the, you know, the, the harvest ranges for us in the High Plains, we're typically not harvesting until the very end of August to the beginning of September for most of our varietals. And typically in the hill country, it would be kind of early, mid, you know, August that we're doing most of ours. Um, but this year, Sorry. we harvested more or less on schedule in the hill country a few days early for some of the varietals, but the high plains were coming in uh, at the same couple, time. At the same was, time, That was sort of yeah. the, the oddity this year is it was just yeah. phenomenally intense, which usually yeah. there's sort of the staggering and it just like. Right. And it was all on top. <laughs> so <laughs> Compressed harvest kit. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And some of that's a legacy of the drought even last year and just okay. the conditions through the winter and into the spring. So, but uh, that's why I say, I mean, you know, you, there may be some regions where you can sort of set your watch to the weather. It's not really the case right. here in Texas, so. <laughs> well, it's sort of the inverse of, you know, the, you know, the Pinot Noir regions and the Riesling yeah. regions, right? We have the exact opposite. Well, certainly, yeah. Yeah, and range. certainly if you compare it to like Riesling. Riesling's one of these grapes that you have no idea what it's gonna taste like. Amazing variety of, yeah. uh, of, of taste you can get out of a Riesling. And so Viognier is a little bit like that. Yeah. So, but at the other end, right, at the hot, hot weather variety. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this is just, this is really, really, very tasty. Um, Perfume you can drink. <laughs> oh my goodness! I mean, and, and you're right. You know, <laughs> there is a there is like I guess a perfume type quality of of even on the palate, um, but um, you know, there's there's a. I don't know, like kind of a bit of sweetness, but it's not it's not like it's a sweet wine, but there's that you know, that, that fruity there's we get a the, that all the time there's a when fruit we're doing quality to it. Um, I, I would say there's a honey thing, but there is something that I'm I'm getting that I'm I'm a little puzzled. I don't really know what what it is. Honestly, it kind of reminds me of breakfast, I guess in a general term, a general <laughs> a general type of uh, um, a way. And it, I, I don't know if it's necessarily like it's a, a citrus thing, or or, or there's a or is a, a, a honey or some type of thing. But it kind of made me think of breakfast. Now maybe it's because I didn't have any breakfast today, <laughs> and this is my breakfast. breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I, I, I woke up in plenty of time and then I decided to sleep a little longer and then they had a continental breakfast at the hotel that I didn't, I didn't just decide not to do and I thought, well, I'll just on the way here stop at McDonald's and somehow I missed it. <laughs> the, the one McDonald's in Fredericksburg, but, um, <laughs> and have, and have, uh, what do I usually get? I usually get like a McGriddle, <laughs> but I was not going to have any orange juice because I don't want my palate to be destroyed with, with orange, the orange, uh, with that, but no, it's, um, 
No, but there's, I guess, because maybe I'm thinking about melons and fruits and that type of stuff that, you know, that some sometimes, you know, a typical uh, breakfast food type of thing, so. No, we very often when doing pourings, people will say, oh, no, it is a sweet wine. And we're like, no, there's no residual sugar in this. <laughs> it's just because it is so fruity, people right. people yeah. taste it as sweet as opposed to, Right, we were, yeah. Yeah. we were talking about that, you know, my, my day job, I, I get asked a sweet red wine, I'm like, we don't have any, but we have fruity wine, and that's the, there's that perception of, of sweetness when there really is no residual sugar in it. But yeah. no, I mean it's it's very smooth, very tasty. I mean it's 2012, so it's very young. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. you know. Young. So I expect it'll it'll develop a lot more. Sure. Um, and we had a Texan where we we had a Viognier though, right? We had a 2011 probably. 2011. Yeah, yeah. And that, yeah. the tasting break. Yeah. 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 Okay, I'm gonna get a, a bucket because we didn't bring that out. No. Okay. okay. And you have a fly in your. Uh, Fly on your Viognier. You have a fly on Viognier. Even the fly loves it. Yeah. <laughs> nice horse up would be proud. <laughs> exactly. No, this is this is a, a wonderful thing. We were when we were uh, touring the winery part. Um, we were talking about presses. So right. you have a basket press. Sure. So I wasn't. I probably have seen pictures of it. And I probably have heard of it, but I didn't really understand what it was. We'll talk about that versus the um, the bladder. Sure. What what, what the differences are? Uh, well, I mean, basket press is a little bit more to the traditional design, um, and it's definitely for a smaller scale type of operation like what we're doing. It allows us. Most of our fermentations are done in small batches. We're doing typically small bends, and it's really well suited for that because we can go through and do, you know, one after another small batches. It's very gentle, and so we don't get a lot of harsh pressing on on our wines and it's really designed for the red wines that we're doing mm -hmm. harvesting from our vineyards here locally um, for some of the whites we do in fact use presses out near the vineyards in the high plains because we also you know one of the, the, the critical components with any of these particularly the whites is to get them into you know to be processed early and fast so we'll go to a press that's there at the vineyard and do that so okay. Um, but no, like I said, the basket press for, you know, all of these open top fermentations and small fermentations like what we do is, yeah, it's an ideal, ideal match, so. Now that's something that I, I probably haven't really asked people about, but so when, when you're getting your stuff from the High Plains or really just in general when people are getting juice that isn't on location right. or close, um, normally that is, it's, it's, it's been pressed and then it goes to the winery for, for the processing rather than the grapes being transported because is that in the case of a case of a white yeah with the case of a red we'll often distem up there and so that in that case we'll either end up bringing up our distemmer and doing it up there or okay. you know do it again with uh, with one of the, some of the vineyards actually have facilities at their at their spot but this is something that's evolved i mean you'll see this in places like washington state too where you see sometimes these western wineries on one end and these eastern vineyards and they're they're doing the transport but i mean the, one of the keys is is that you know we, when we're working with a vineyard outside of our own, it really, we still have to do all the same things we would have to do at our own vineyard in terms of being in there regularly to really kind of work with growers and establish a practice that suits what we want in terms of finished wines and then harvest it means mm -hmm. doing all of those things that we, we want to see, which we do with a close vineyard like our own. So, right. Um, so I mean, and it's, and it's luckily, you know, as the industry has grown, that's gotten a little easier actually because there are more in the way of you know, facilities already out there as opposed to us or others, you know, taking out their equipment every time we're going to be mm -hmm. doing our harvests. So, anyway. Very good. All right. Um, so what are we going to do next? We're going to do... Um, we're going to do the Tempranillo, the right? Tempranillo next. Okay. And awesome. Tempranillo is a grape <laughs> we we're very excited about. And um, on the red side... When, when I'm out talking to, to consumers or sommeliers, I, I, I tell everyone each wine region has a flagship grape, right? California has the Cab, Oregon has the Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir right. Argentina, Malbec, Malbec. Mm -hmm. and for Texas, the Tempranillo is becoming the big red right. grape. Yeah. It's, when we started a few years ago, there were only a few wineries doing the Tempranillo, and now there are several dozen doing Tempranillo. So, and I'm in agreement with with I think you know from all my conversations with with uh, Texas wineries and just in, in reading about Tempranillo and there's an, enough similarities really between Spain and Texas and even like with Viognier right. with the similarities with the Southern Rhone in Texas that you know there there seems to be a natural 
uh, it, sh it should be a natural thing that that this should do well and like I said sometimes you think something will do well and it doesn't but sure. you know I, I think a Tempranillo is really something that Texas um, wineries um, hopefully are, are really gravitating towards and I I've had some amazing Tempranillos from Texas so I think I think it's you know I, I'm in agreement that it's a, it's a it's a grape that really can hold you know um, can grab hold here and can become you know a, a grape that we're known for yeah yeah, no, when we, uh, when we first started, I think we looked and there were just two or three wineries really that were, were doing Tempranillos. And I mean, in that, you know, seven years, we've gone back and done that sort of, sort of resurvey, the wineries that are out there of the top 100, well over half now are doing Tempranillos. And I mean, it's really just, it's become, I want to say it's become a mainstay, but it is definitely, I think everybody's gravitating towards because they're seeing what it is that the varietal does here and just, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, it wasn't. I mean, yeah, it wasn't a well-known varietal, you know, yeah. in the United States in general. Um, so that's it's partially that's a learning process. But when you see it in the vineyard, you see it. I mean, yeah. it is just such a happy grape. <laughs> well, <laughs> just these big, happy, dark blue clusters, yeah. and you know, it's just. Mm -hmm. Even the internal spell check on my phone and the computer thinks I spell it wrong every time. <laughs> <laughs> a little red line under it. I'm like, no, I'm spelling it right. Trust me. I'm yeah. spelling this. I'm spelling it right. That's yeah, right. you know you're using special leave right. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's yeah. not a doc. A word doc. When Microsoft comes around, mm. we'll, we will have to right. it. So. Yeah. That's but it's true. never going to be grown at Washington State. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, uh, I think uh, yeah, I, we've had a very good response from the from the sommelier community mm. to to our our efforts to, to promote Tempranillo and I think I think you have a wine list they already have 15 caps and, and 10 Merlots and so to bring something new to the table something unique something which is good for this area here that's that's a good fit right for, uh, for a restaurant wine list so a lot of the restaurants that pick up our wines they pick up you know, the, the Tempranillo and on the white side it's, it's the Viognier so, mm. yeah. it's, um, with the second towards the GSM. Right. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. you know, as, as a consumer, and when I go out to restaurants um, and I look at wine lists, um, and just and just just in general, when I when I buy wine, not just for the show, but when I buy wine just to drink, uh, I I look for things that are outside of the ordinary or outside of the normal, you know, four or five varietals that everybody has, um, and and uh, I think that the wine show itself, I, I haven't taken a survey of exactly how many uh, wines that are not Cab and Merlot uh, sure. and Chardonnay but I tend to seem to buy stuff that's a little different because I, I, I like for the I like to have the new things and, and things that are unusual and different I think that's just a you know part of my personality but um, when I see it on the wine list you know I get a little excited I'm like oh cool there's something besides Cab mm -hmm. and Merlot that I can have or on exactly. the white side exactly. Chardonnay and even Sauvignon Blanc that I can that I can enjoy and Usually, when it's on a list, that meant that whoever created the list felt that it ro works well with their menu, right. with the food, and that's you know that's also something that you know I think really is very instrumental with restaurants in their wine list and getting getting wines that work well with their food. Mm -hmm. right. You know whether they have a psalm on site or not. You know just does someone put a little thought into the process of, right. of, of putting wines on there? Absolutely. Yeah, no, if you see a Tempranillo, it's because someone tasted said no, 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 we really should have this. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if you see a cab. <laughs> you don't know <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I mean, for me on on, on the nose, a um, little bit of vanilla on there, um, getting the red fruits. Um, I get a little of, uh, of the smoke bomb. Hello, B. <laughs> I get a little of everything. Else. Remember, yeah. wine and wasp stuff mix. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm wild. I'm, I, yeah, I'm not. Now you know why when I we talked about earlier that if I ever owned a winery. I couldn't because I really couldn't really be out. I mean, I like sitting outside and I like the outside, but I know that the I know that all those all those wonderful wasps and bees that happen in the vineyard, I would don't yeah, no, like. You them. you should, would definitely dislike harvest. Yeah. <laughs> harvest it's, time would be horrible for me. Solid bees. So, yeah. Up close and personal. Up close with, and uh, personal. With the insect world. So. Yeah, no. It's uh, um, I had an episode where I was down in Rockport and a wasp decided to to be friends with me and and. Um, I got up a few times because I'm just not a good, I'm not friends <laughs> with them, so. Yeah, no, you, uh, I, I got burned this year as we had, when we were doing the, the Tempranillo, in fact. Yeah. Uh, there was, you know, you, a wasp 
nest will basically take over a whole vine, mm -hmm. right? right? And so you walk up to this thing and you're like, oh, someone missed all the grapes. And then of course, <laughs> you know, all these wasps emerge and I got stung twice this yeah. year. So, uh, but no, I mean, the number of bees is actually quite even more right. striking than the wasps. Yeah. So, because they just... They love it, right? Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, remember, you, we you can't... start crushing the grapes. We need them. You know, well, you need them can. first of all, right, yeah. you do need them. Yeah. yeah. No, they're essential. They're just, uh, you know, they have different intentions at, uh, <laughs> yes, at harvest right. time than you do. <laughs> yeah. And they're very sorry to see the last of the grapes Yeah, go. no, they're not happy <laughs> they're, to have you all at all. They're defending. Well, I can tell you, like, on the palate, I mean, it's, it's really smooth. Um, you know, there's no harsh tannins. I mean, the tannins are well-structured. It's, it's, it's well-integrated in the wine. Um, you know, I still get that fruit forwardness. Um, still get the red fruits on it. Don't get as much as the vanilla as I do on, on, the, on the nose. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really, I, I would call it very smooth, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's, it's very enjoyable and it's, um, I, I really want to say it's quaffable, but that's only because I've been reading that, uh, I had been reading, um, the wine Bible. No, I've been reading actually another book, um, recommended by a friend of mine. It was, uh, Making Sense of Italian Wine, and he likes us to use the word quaffable very frequently in the book, so, yeah, so just, that's so kind of been in my, yeah. my vocabulary, but, but it's, it's something that you could, um, you could drink on its own, but I would love to have it with food. You know, it's something that, right. you know, definitely a food wine. Yeah, um, it, it pairs very well with meat dishes. It oh just, yeah. It just complements them. It's what I always taste is, is a little of the leather also mm -hmm. on, on the palate, which it just is different, right? It, it, it's very nice, the fruit and then the leather together. You know, it just gives, uh, There's definitely, you know, definitely nice little, little bit of earthiness to it. Which, which um, uh, vintage is this? 2010. 10? Okay. No. 2010. And this is te this is the Texas Hill Country AVA, so this is all here. Yeah. Okay. So none of it's from the high plains. Yeah. So, yeah. Which I thought made a particularly nice wine. Sure. Yeah. Um, my particular. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. No, this is another another great example of a Texas Tempranillo, and I think everybody should have one of these. So <laughs> <laughs> it's great stuff. Great stuff. Yeah. All right, so we have a GSM coming up. Now, for those of you who may not know what a GSM is, is Grenache, Syrah, and Mavedra. Um, uh, Rome varietals, right? Mm, yeah. Okay. S Southern Rome varietals. Yeah. And um, it's a trio of grapes, and, and what we usually say is that they, that they like each other. They, <laughs> they, they go very well together. Yeah. And, uh, they're, they're great friends. Yes. yes. <laughs> they, yeah, they play well together. Yeah. So, um, mm. But uh, it's a nice trio of grapes, and uh, and um, so each year the proportions in this blend will, will vary a yeah. little bit depending on, on harvest and, and uh, David's yeah. uh, blending decisions. Sure. And, uh, so, uh, now is this blended, um, now do you blend after everything is, is everything fermented separately or do you, and then you make your, then you make your blending decisions after the fermentation? So we've, we've, well, one thing we found is, well, things like Syrah, we found a little co-fermentation sometimes can help. And so we'll do a little of that. We've done that. We've, we've done experiments with that with Mavedra too, because, you know, with each of these, there's a lot of traditional styles that'll actually do that in order to enhance some of the, uh, the aromatics and in terms of the color that you get from the grapes. But by and large, we'll, we like almost everything. We do our fermentation separate in terms of each vineyard, each plot. We do in sort of small fermentations. We'll actually age them again as separate lots in their own unknown section of barrels, and then the blending is done afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, now that said, I mean there's certain sort of in terms of the blending proportions, there's certain things that that come back and go back again. We typically are doing a you know, relatively low proportion of the of the Grenache, and then. Um, where there's some variation typically is whether we're, you know, whether Mavedra winds up out on top or Syrah comes out on top in terms of the blending proportions. Um, but these are, you know, these are a case of three varietals where I, I feel like there are some nice varietal wines I'm seeing of each of these in Texas, but as a whole, as a, as a blended set, I think they actually do better because they come together and create a balance that's a little bit more complete. So, and we grow them and then obviously work them in the winery with the intention of blending them this way and right. blending them in, in sets like this. So. Now is each each grape bring a certain um, I guess bring certain characteristics to the wine you know sure. uh, what what 
What I, I guess you know what what does the Syrah and the Grenache and the Medjugorje what what do they bring to the table as far as complementing each other? Um, there's almost like a little spiciness with the Syrah sometimes that we'll get. Um, we with the Mavedra, it's it's kind of the I don't want to say it's almost the backbone. Like it has like a nice kind of mid-range fruit, has a little bit of leather and some other qualities in there that we like. Whereas the Grenache is kind of the really kind of fruity, nice outside edge, and it's a great one when you blend it in to sort of bring back that fruit forward quality that you want in the wine. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's got beautiful aromatics. Yeah, you know, by itself. We don't get the color here, uh, yeah. but by itself, you just you know, you just want to sit there and smell the Grenache. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's wonderful right. stuff. But it really, it, it you know, as a wine, it's it's better once blended. Yeah. So. yeah. so no, but like I said, when it's all put together, it, you know, kind of these 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 work together well. So, you know. great. All right, so let's dive into yeah. this. Beautiful. Color. We use another music analogy. So basically, mm -hmm. so having all three is like you know they they're a well. A, a, a well-balanced uh, band or a well-balanced song and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. instead of just something that's just barreling through on its own. Yeah. Just off the nose on its own, this is probably, of the three, probably my favorite so far. Mm -hmm. I'm really liking everything that's, that's coming through on this. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, there's a, there's a complexity to it. Um, that it's just really nice. Mm. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's just nice. It's that Grenache from Mourvedre, mm -hmm. I always think, is the. Yeah. yeah. Right. Too. Yeah. Just, there, there is something about the way they complement each other. There, I mean, to, to taste a little bit of Grenache by itself, taste a little Mourvedre by yourself, you're like, no way. Yeah. <laughs> that these are ever going to be friends. Well, we've done that with wine club members where we'll have them, you know, you'll taste each one individually and then when they taste the combination, they're just amazed because right. it's, you know, you wouldn't, you can't necessarily pull out each of the individual wines, but when you see that, you know, it's not necessarily a one plus one plus one sort of thing, that it really actually, you get something greater than the parts. And again, that's, that is sort of the, the ultimate one. When you're blending, you're hoping that you actually can do something like that. So, but right. they, they do. Because I, I really find that there's there's a nice balance between the fruit and minerality, um, and and I will, I don't really get too much of a floral aspect, but um, but I mean just having that balance between between the the fruit and the minerality is just is just really nice. There's yeah. nothing no, no one thing is really overpowering the other. Sure. Um, And on, on the palate for me, there's really the minerality I think really speaks for, you know, there's there's a bit of earthiness to it. You know, I am getting that bit of leather and getting that, um, with Italian wines I get what's called accordion case. I don't really get it here, but I get some of that leather and a little bit of, a little bit of earth out of it. Um, with accordion case, and, and it has to do with my father and his accordion and growing up, um, it's leather, felt, and dust. And <laughs> Italian wines tend to have a lot of dust to them, but we also get that leather and they feel like get that yeah, felt part. Right. But, yeah. you know, with this, I, I really get, you know, I do get that leather out of it. And I, it, it feels like there's a little bit of that mustiness, mm -hmm. you know, a little, no, nothing, you know, not not a lot like you get with Italian wines, but there's, there's that hint of that, right. mm -hmm. you know, and, um, it's very smooth, you know. Tannins again are, are are nice. They're not they're not overpowering, you know. So it's it's a great it's a great blend, mm -hmm. and um, it probably is my favorite of the three. I like I like all three a lot. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm not saying that the Viognier wasn't good. So I like Viognier and I like this Viognier and I like the Tempranillo. I'm just saying it was my favorite of okay. of, of the three. So, um, you know, this is it's tasty. It's it's well balanced, you know, and. You know, this is uh, stuff we had, you know, talked about having, you know, that your your goal is to have some world class wines, and that's your concentration. Is you're really trying to you're truly really trying to create that, and you're not trying to be all things for everybody. I think that's right. what you said. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, to be everything to everybody, and, and and not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that. I mean, some some wineries uh, around the country, not just Texas, but around the country, you know, are have that ability to to make a lot of they have a lot of variety to what they do. Sure. But um. You know, having you know, being able to concentrate on on what you do well, I think is awesome. You know, mm -hmm. you know, some some places are able to have they have that ability to do a lot, but being able to concentrate and specialize is really great. You know, and mm -hmm. these these are all wonderful wines. I mean, this is again, this is probably my favorite of the three. 
but all three are wonderful wines. And I just got some chocolate all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the things, like you know, with with wines in general, is just like it's it's been airing out for a little bit. I mean, and in the glass, it's it's developing and, and being able to get something different every time. You know, every few minutes. Mm -hmm something different happens and something yeah. else is, is is opening up or in the palate that that same thing and those those are the ones that i feel are really you know those those have that extra bit of special character to them right. you know and, and and this this wine already you know just in a few minutes already got me something different and it keeps developing so it's it's wonderful yeah and it's you know, awesome. These are not hundred dollar wines. You know, the, right. the Viognier and the Timpani are in the in the teens. Up to, right. You know, Whole Foods or Specs or whatever you, uh, you find them, and the, the GSM here is in the in the twenties. So right. We, we we think of them as good values. And you can put them up against you know you can put them up against you know higher higher dollar wines, and mm -hmm. I think they they'll stand up just fine. You know, mm -hmm. because you know we when we talked about when I talked about the show is that you know we. I have I usually have an under twenty and over twenty, but over twenty doesn't mean I'm, I'm having hundred dollar bottles of wine. It's usually forty and under. I you know I'm trying to I try to keep it at least you know somewhat reasonable. But um, you know these these are some these are some awesome wines. I, I think they're they're great. And I've, granted, I've already had some of them in the past, so I already 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 had an idea what I was going to be getting into. But um, these are some awesome wines. Um, you have anything else you want to talk about? We haven't really we haven't really talked about yet. Um, no, I think I think you touched on the important points. The focus, okay. our philosophy here, letting the terroir and the grapes talk and express themselves, and not trying to pretend to be something that we're not. We're, right. We grow grapes here in Texas, and we're proud of it. And if we grow the right kinds of grapes, we can make world class wine right here in Texas. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, um, we're going to wrap things up. Just one thing to say is that if, if, if you're in Texas or if you're coming to Texas, coming to the Hill Country, you need to come over here because um, I took some pictures of what we're seeing, okay, of, of, of just the view from where we're at here on the deck, on the patio. It's phenomenal. Uh, the property is beautiful. Uh, you got to come out here. The tasting room's great. I'll, I'll try to remember to take some pictures inside with the tasting room. Um, We've got some somewhere along the line. Probably took some footage or showed you the footage of of the um, of the uh, basket press and, and the barrel uh, all over there. You know, it's it's a wonderful facility that you need to come out. Um, I guess something we didn't talk about. There's uh, there was like uh, there was a private area. Do you do you have events out here probably and some tastings yeah. right? Yeah. Um, we do. We do. The, the tasting room is open every day. You know, right. Walk-ins and then we taste at the bar. And if you call in advance, make an appointment. We do VIP tastings, and it's a more, you know, one-on-one -on -one experience. More, it's a you know, secluded. Um, it's a. It you could get be, pairings. And we do small, yeah. small yeah. pairings for the wines. Yeah. So okay. So you have yeah. You just or, have more more time to think about it than if you yeah. just stand. I mean, if you're standing at the bar, you know, you're gonna. Yeah. You only want to stand so long in the VIP lounge. You can really sit. You can take your time and yeah. right. talk with somebody here who's knowledgeable about the wines. So. Awesome. Well, um, we're gonna like so we're gonna wrap things up as always. Um, first of all, I just want to thank all of you for spending some time with me. It's it's, an, it's incredible. Um, you know the hospitality that everyone has extended in, in, in the Hill Country and um, in this visit and every other visit has been wonderful. Um, but uh, I just want to thank you for, for spending some time with me uh, today. And then for everybody out there, again, thanks for stopping by. Um, as always, uh, click the links above. Um, leave comments below. I'll have, I'll have links over here for Pertinalis uh, so you can check them out. And uh, we'll see everyone again next time. <laughs>